Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our International Ground Rounds. I'm very delighted today uh, to have a friend of mine uh, and a colleague. We met each other a um, few months ago during the ERS meeting in Thessaloniki. I had the pleasure to, to see him, to, to learn something from him. But then, fortunately, I've learned that he's also doing not only sinus surgery, but also involved in, uh, in, a, in rhinoplasty. I was fascinated by his work and I've asked him to have a talk. Uh, so good morning, Serkan, good morning. Good morning, good morning, Puya, how are you? Good, thank you. So uh, today's talk from Serkan will be focused uh, on, uh, on a matter of when, whenever you want to choose which approach address when you're doing a, ran, a, a nose job. So today's talk is going to be focused on a structural and preservation rhinoplasty and how to choose if you do both of them. So in this case, uh, he will address uh, a talk of 25 minutes and uh, a lot of videos will be shared from him. If you have any question, as usual, I will remind you to type your question and we will answer to those questions at the end. So, Sirkan, please, if you would share your screen. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Priya. I'm going to do it right now. Uh, can you hear me? Hopefully, you're hearing me very nicely. And yes. Yes, I think it's right. So, Thank you for your invitation, by the way. As a friend, I know you from, from meetings. We were in a cranial base and orbital endoscopic uh, surgery meeting. And then now we are speaking about rhinoplasty. So my speech is about structural and preservation primary rhinoplasty. How to choose in between if you do both? Because the question is, as a surgeon, we struggle it every day. And am I wise enough to choose the right technique, the best technique for the particular patient? Otherwise, we can fail or we can struggle more in the surgery. So um, actually, uh, I just want to, sorry. Uh, the questions are starting with what kind of a nose has been imagined, actually by the patient and also by the surgeon because this is very important in choosing the techniques that, that are in our logic. So what is the least risky technique to achieve this outcome in our mind's imagination? And then the outcome that is determined by the technique or the surgeon. In my hands, as, a, as an experienced surgeon, I now try to use the techniques according to my expectations of, of this surgery. So. Um, sometimes we are very limited if we're doing just one surgery at a, at a as a technique and we can we can just stuck in the middle and can't get the we uh, can't get out of the limitations of the technique so these are two cases on the left side you see it's a preservation on the other side is a structural for a primary and so the, the, the first one is a natural dorsum, but which is lowered, less projected one, which shows itself in a different manner. And the other one has been reconstructed all the way new. And so uh, both patients are happy, but why should we choose in between those techniques? So these are other patients. Let's see, they have crooked septum. One is more crooked on the dorsum, which has a not smooth dorsum lines. The other patient has smooth dorsum lines. And on the left side, we decided to do a preservation. Why? Because the patient asked for most possible natural result that you can get to me. And she came to me for once, another time, another time she was insisting on, can I get really a kind of, natural result yeah for sure we were speaking and we tried to understand her the other patient was insisting on the thinnest bridge as possible and a more like barbie like nose and then let's say not barbie but like like a nose which is which is more like thinnest possible on her face and smallest possible so the thing is in in preservation techniques mostly you are 
bound by your dorsum stop point. I mean, if you have a very large, I mean, wide dorsum, then you, when you lower it, it may look a little bit wider, but it's natural. The transition is are very, very good. And in the other case, you may thin as, it, as, as in a structural case, like, like the one I show you here, and you may get the thinnest possible outcome that you may try at least. And this is the bump that we love or we hate actually. So actually the, th the question is let, let's preserve it or let's reject it and reform and reconstruct the bridge again. So I am gonna in the end of this speech, I do both, but what is my technique and how I choose in between all of them, you will understand in the end of this speech. So my philosophy as a surgeon is there is no one road to success, all right? So this is something when I was in Nice in a meeting of, of uh, Yves Saban, and uh, my speech was about the bridge and I asked it on my Instagram. And believe me, half people said that rejected and reconstructed and then the other half said that preserve and reform this. So it's the same in surgery in real life. So we can do both. Which technique in my logic loads the least risk to the patient? This question is very important to achieve the best possible outcome in my mind. There is no best single technique as far as I know. And always like think in the favor of a patient. Sorry for just the spelling error anyway. So first let's start with preservation. And this is how I do it. You already know it very well. I speak her names comes from Italy. And also we have to remind uh, Valerio Finocchi about this modification of Cuddle's technique. So first you start with septoplasty, you separate it, and also you separate it from the ethmoid lamina. You don't have to do it, but in the end, for the top, you have to come to the Renian part here on the top point of the bridge, which is being called Renian. And then you reject a kind of low strip. Don't be very harsh when doing this. Do it just step by step. Increase it gradually. You reject the low, uh, low bridge. This patient had a bony higher um, resection. So under the bump, we reject the bony part, which is ethmoid lamina under the, under the bump. And then we reject it. And I just measure it with the bayonet pens uh, and also then I decide if my radix osteotomy or transverse osteotomy just in the same place that I resected. And then when I say, okay, uh, I start to just remove, uh, I do the osteotomies and remove the bone. I do let down, I never use push down. I'm gonna tell you why is that in my hands. Uh, but we have to accept that they're not, they can be, you know, substitution to each other, but, you know, they are not the same. So to, to achieve the best result in your mind, you have to have a kind of uh, selections and, and, and like uh, preferences. Then this is one of the most important stitches that you may do. Uh, you bind the uh, caudal septum again to the anterior nasal spine. It should be at least three to four stitches. You may use the pillar stitches techniques, which I learned from Carlos Neves. He's gonna be spe uh, speaking in your, in your also portal. And so the pillar stitches are very good for caudal septum um, fixation and also uh, a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, straightening. I'm gonna pass this part and in the end you will have, you will finish the surgery with tip plasty and in the end you will have a kind of nose, which is now you see the third year outcome of this patient. In the first years, the patient had no issues. She's super, super happy right now. You will understand. There's no big issues, but the thing is when we go inside the nose in a close up way, we see that the bone is starting to show itself after three years because the skin gets dry. This is a very natural and very nice nose still, but why couldn't I just see this after before three years? And what did I didn't what I didn't do? So that was a kind of SPQR one, and I didn't dissect the dorsum skin. 
And now I we have some kind of maneuvers that we can do to overcome the recoil of the dorsum issues. And how can we reduce the dorsum recoil? For sure, when we are doing this, I now uh, we are doing. I'm an university guy. I'm an associate professor in Ege University in Izmir. This is a dynamo meter. This means that you uh, you just can measure the force of the recoil when you're doing this. So you pull it to the place that you want. You release it, and then you see that what happens the the recoil of the bridge uh, goes to that level. I mean, the force of the recoil. And then we are starting to do some kind of additional maneuvers compared to push down. The additional maneuvers include um, doing letdown or doing rasping or doing like lateral K point dissections like better in the maneuver. And then, for example, this is a letdown, do it. And then you measure again, and also you do LKA dissection, like almost you separate the uh, upper lateral cartilage from the bone on the sides to, to be able to open and, and uh, just reduce the recoil of the bridge. And then also you may do a rasping to the bone bridge. What you get is our preliminary result says that the section of the dorsum in preservation rhinoplasty enables additional maneuvers like LK dissection, rasping, hybrid rhinoplasty, and grafting. So non-dissection cases are only reserved for small part of patients, which you don't need to lower the bridge a lot. And also the second thing, rasping of the bony bumps tends to be the most important factor in additional maneuvers to break the resistance of the bony bridge. This is just a study, what we do, and we try to measure the effect of the additional maneuvers and what gave what they can bring to us this is about uh, the preservation how i let's come to how i do the structural cases and this is one of my life surgery patients as a bum she doesn't want to have a like a barbie nose and you may see that she needs the kind of italian like style and i mean a natural one which is still uh, looking strong but feminine on her face and then we start the surgery. I do closed approach all the way. Even I do preservation or I do structural. I preserve the ligaments. You know, ligaments are not just for holding the tip. They're just for separating the surgery. Like the tip should be in this part of the, of the, uh, the skin and the other side should be on the, on the bridge. So we separate the skin into like uh, components and and it's, it's very important for me to do. And I do the tip dissection first before the bridge, but not tip plasty, just the dissection of the cartilages. I never do sub, uh, subperichondrial dissection for the tip cartilages. I do uh, subsmass dissection and also just deep uh, supraperichondrial dissection. And then I try to just as you see the pitangis ligament there i try to just cut in between the pitangis ligament and separate it into three you see that pitangis is hanging there and you decide how much but it shouldn't be very very small amount of of one for example if the tip is too droopy if you want to make a big change then you have to dissect inside the pitangi a little bit more than you do in nature and then I do the septoplasty and I go to the resection part. Then I am going to resect the part of the dorsum. So first, before everything, I always rasp the sides. I rasp the sides to get the best possible outcome for both sides, like the convexity and concavity. And I don't want any uh, irregularities on the sides. And then I prepare my, I use flaps and grafts. I'm going to show all of them. This is, uh, this is septum and be, when, when I'm separating it, uh, I separate the lower uh, upper lats and then wait, I reject a small amount and then I always rasp a little bit. And this is how I do the flaps. You cut the upper lat like that. And then inside the upper lat, the mucosa and perichondrium is just holding everything. It's, it's not just like, like uh, you, you just bend it, it's, you cut it. 
And then you dissect the caudal part, which is still keeping the mucosa. I mean, it's mucosa is intact still, but you dissect it. I'm going to show you how I reconstruct again. This is how I use Microsoft. This is the uh, transverse line that you see. And then whenever I do transverse osteotomies, I do medial osteotomies also to reject the uh, veg resections on the, on the bony wall. And then I do the incisions separately for lateral osteotomies. I rasp, always I rasp the sides to have a kind of obtuse angle from maxilla, from cheek to come to the nose. I don't want any, uh, any uh, like, like very uh, steep angles anyway. Uh, so then I do the osteotomies. I release the bone. I always leave a hinge. Maybe you saw the transverse osteotomies are not full. They're just, uh, they're just on the upper part. And then I reject the caudal part if the septum is stretching that much. And now it's time to reconstruct. You see the flaps there. And, but I saw, this is important. I saw that the septum is crooked and I cannot be able to make it smooth. And in the midline without any graft. So first I put a spreader graft, but I use the grafts only on one side in, uh, in crooked noses. And also I use them not in the border of, of the dorsum. I use them two to three millimeters below the dorsum line to get the best possible outcome. And this is how I do it. Then the flaps lateral side is being su sutured to the flaps lateral side on the other side. Yeah, like that. Very good. This is septum lateral flap, lateral flap, and medial flap is free, but not too free. I mean, it's hanging to the mucosa and perichondrium. It's been dissected. So what it gives, it doesn't, it doesn't show itself on the dorsum's top point, but it is causing a bulkiness to give the effect of a roof of a house. So how can we get the thinnest possible outcome in a bridge? You have to build a triangle shaped bridge, not a pinched one or not a boxy one. We need a triangle shape. So we have to give a triangle shape means that we have to have a kind of a kind of volume underneath. So the top is very thin and then the flaps are inside. As you may see, the septum is crooked as C shape. This is lateral flap and there is also, what is the, the what is the one of the most problematic parts of uh, structural cases is the bone to cartilage transition is not natural anymore. So what we get is the 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 bone to transition. We may end up with an inverted B or we may end up with an open roof deformity. This is one of the most seen complications or deformities on structural cases. So this kind of flap use, I, I named this as a floating spreader flap. You raise the flap up to the level of the bone. Like this is lateral flap on right side. This is medial flap. This is septum. This is again, the medial flap and lateral flap on the other side. So the second stitch very close to the bone has been used like that. So you get from the medial, septum, medial, and then to lateral, septum, lateral. So what you get, you get like an oblique flap, which is on the caudal part, it's droopy, but it, which is on the bony part, I mean the cephalic part, which is raised up to the level of bone. Then what you get, if, if I can show you, in the end is the, there is no space between the bones like that you're gonna see it yeah the flap is raised to the level of the bone here there's no gap and then you may continue your surgeries this is a kind i call a floating flap and by doing so you may get a triangle shape which is not causing a boxy thing if you put everything side by side to spread or flap scraps what happens you get a boxy thing even it's been thin but it doesn't show itself as a thin bridge it should be triangle shape and then I always do like it's a natural case. The caudal septum should be um, should be interacted with the per, um, perichondrium. I always 
suture the pericondium to the caudal septum and I then do the tip plasty. I dissect it and I don't want to speak about tip plasties too much. I am, uh, I, when this is the end of the surgery, this was a live surgery. And so this is a structural case, which I used a floating spreader flap for reconstruction of the bridge and resection of the dorsum. The patient insisted not to have a natural result. And hopefully we can get a symmetrical one, which is showing itself in the, like this in the frontal view, and then the side view. And now this is the end of the surgery. Again, the question now for, for a structural case, a surgeon has a, who does a structural spreader graphs and flaps, they're friends or foes. So can you use them together? or they're separate things. You use graphs or flaps. In my hands, I always think them together because if I am trying to give volume, I use the flaps. If I'm trying to give strength or for crooked septums, I always add the spreader graphs to this, uh, to this surgery. Like this one, for example, this is a crooked septum. This is a fracture line, as you may see here. I have to use a kind of spreader graph. I use always the spreader graphs, not at the top point of the bridge. I use it as a splinting spreader here. And then what I do when I reconstruct the fracture, then I go with the flap, how I do it. Let's see, I cut the flaps, just the pericondrium and mucosa is keeping the flap inside. Look. This is lateral flap, this is medial flap. And then I suture them like on the caudal septum from lateral to lateral, just the septum in between, so thin as possible. This is the dissection of the perichondrium, like this one, lateral to lateral. The, the inside flap is underneath, so it gives just a triangle shape. But in the upper part, you bring the flap, inner flap between the bones, then you fill the gap that you create in this patient. And before doing that, this, I always rasp the bone and make it thinner and smoother. So this is how I do it. On the caudal part, the flaps are coming like that, giving the natural thin appearance. And then when you raise the flaps, medial parts between the bones, you don't stitch the lateral part. Why? Because it, it becomes inverted V. If you stitch too close to the bone, you get yourself an inverted V. I don't stitch the lateral flaps, never ever very close to the bones. So this gives a triangle, a natural diamond shape, dorsum bridge appearance. Uh, and the same thing. And this patient has also uh, I, how I dissected, I dissected re, on a reverse um, like maneuver like this, and I separate the upper lat and lower lat like this. Anyway, again, I use the graphs and flaps together. This is the flaps. What you get in the end is this is the surgical outcome because this patient has a paraceptal cleft on the left side. You're going to see it right now. It's coming. Uh, so we have to re we had to reconstruct it with the graft and flap together. So you see that the patient had a paraceptal cleft here, and so uh, the the upper lat was bended inside. So I used that part with a grafting and also flap. So you get the thinnest possible, best dorsum lines for your eyes for sure. If it's being good or not, you will decide. But as a surgeon, you can get that kind of result in a, in a structural case. But can you do this preservation? Everything is possible, but you have to use more maneuvers to overcome all of those issues. Maybe you have to use a hybrid one. You can do it. You can excel in your skills, but always I try to choose in, this, in the favor of patient, which is the easiest way in my logic. I try to do it actually. So as a, as a, uh, as a just uh, conclusion, if I have a straight septum in the, uh, in the beginning, I do structural spreader flaps or preservation. 
This is due to patient's expectations and my imagination of the nose. If I want a thin bridge, I go with structural. If I want a natural one, the patient wants a natural, accepts a natural dynamic range, then I go with the preservation. If we have a crooked septum, I use structural spreader grafts on one side and spreader flap together. If it's been a crooked nose, but desirable dorsum lines, which is straight, uh, which is straight dorsum lines, but this nose is crooked, then I use the SPQR like Valerius modification. I use preservation. So this is how I do it as a, as a surgeon who does structural and preservation at the same time. Uh, now my practice is, uh, is like that, uh, Puya. And this is all about what I just want to tell in my practice. And I live in Izmir. This is some wonders of Izmir. Let's say thank you very much for listening to me. I wish you to, to be, to see you in Izmir for sure. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Brilliant uh, results. Of course, there are really a lot of questions and uh, we will go directly one by one from them, from the audience. So the first question is coming from Brazil. What are you using for the infiltration? Infiltration, I use jetacanes, but actually lidocaine plus adrenaline we have in Turkey, but I always dilute it with saline solution and I dilute it one to two, and then I inject it all the submass layer deep to the uh, structures like framework, I mean bone and cartilages. And in revisions also I do that kind of thing, but I dilute this time saline solution with one to five, and I do a hydro dissection. I create a hydro dissection plane. When we speak about revisions, it's going to be very much filled up with this saline and adrenaline solution in the revisions. But in primaries, just one to two uh, dilution is enough. I never use anything else. But during the surgery, I always wash the nose with a solution which you have adrenaline inside, transamine inside, and also you have the prednisolone inside um for uh, i was uh, i was very impressed by the the amount of revision you you perform i was uh, i was very fascinated by the fact that you using a lot um uh, bones and also cartilage from the ribs so mm -hmm. in regards to this there's another question that's coming from france what are you using for revision cases in uh, cases of crook nose? Okay, if the patient has enough cartilages for the tip, if it's been tip crookedness, I always want to use the original tip cartilages as a, as a, a reasonable surgeon would do because the best cartilage for the tip is the lower lateral cartilage itself. For the bridge, I never use ear cartilage, never ever use. I always use the septum, if there is no available septum, I go with the rib, patient's own rib. And you already know, but maybe people don't know, I always do closed approach revisions, even in lengthening cases and even in, in rib revisions, I insist on doing the closed approach, just some small, um, uh, I have kind of ex uh, expectations. Anyway, so the thing is, I use rib for the bridge, and ear composites for the tip. Otherwise, uh, is not the best material for the tip. But we can we can speak on that in detail in revision rhinoplasties. Another question is coming from Russia. Uh, what are the limits of preservation rhinoplasty? Okay, the first limit is you rely on patients' own. Um, wide or thin, but on uh, structure. So you try to keep it. So if it's been good, if it's been thin, then when you lower it, if it's, it's gonna look a little bit wider than it was before. We have to accept this. If it's been wide, like mine, my nose is strong and wide. When you, when you reduce its, its projection, then what you get, of course you can get a fine result, but it's gonna be, Natural, but it's going to be wide. Sorry, it's going to be wide. If it's been wide, you're starting with wide. It's going to stay wide. Otherwise, you can do a hybrid rhinoplasty. You pass into separating the dorsum while doing a preservation. And many surgeons and many good surgeons are doing this. 
and then you may get a thinner one or, or straighter one. But the first limitation of a preservation rhinoplasty is in my hands, at least you cannot decide the septums, uh, the, the bridge thinning or just like, like it stays as itself. And so it looks wider than before because you lowered the bridge. Another question is coming from Spain. What are the steps you take for a structural rhinoplasty? Okay, first, uh, structural means like for the tip structural or the bridge. I, as far as I understand, they're asking the bridge. So what I do is first, before everything, I rasp the bony bridge. I rasp it to get the smoothest possible lateral lines, all right, before breaking the hump. I am just rasping the sides. And when I feel that it's, it's been very smooth under my uh, fingers, and then I start to just resect the bony bridge. I'm, I'm not doing it in one piece, but I remove it always with an, uh, with a, with an osteotom because my rasps are, it's, it's too much time to rasp the cortex, all right? You can get rid of small amount of cortex and then you can rasp in a very faster way. Always rasp in the end because the osteotom creates the edges like that to the outside. You have to rasp to have a very smooth one. This is the first thing. This is the second thing to resect with the osteotome and then rasp again to get the smoothest possible edges of the bone. And then I separate the upper lateral cartilage from the septum in its highest position. And then I create my flaps. Flaps are cut, never bended. I never bend my flaps, I cut them. But first, I always leave, like when you're doing Ishida, you peel the upper lats under the bony vault. And I do the same thing. You peel, you never resect any part of upper lats, even under the bone. You peel them under the bone, you cut them, you flap them, all right? And then you dissect only the caudal part a little bit more. So the caudal flaps are separated like that. The flaps around the key area are very close to each other, but still with a cut, just the pericondium keeps it intact. What I do, the flaps are like this. This is the, this is the bridge that we want. The caudal flap is just staying under, under the um, uh, top point of the bridge, but around the bone, it comes superior to fill the gap between the bones and give some support not to have an inverted V deformity there. So this is my general um, uh, structural uh, rhinoplasty technique, mostly in my hands. I use flaps. Other questions, this time from Poland. Are you recommending preoperative CT scan? No, I'm an ENT. I use endoscopes. I use every instruments to see everything. So, and I am not a fan of people like if, if in the CT scan, everything is smooth, I'm not separating it. No, I'm not that guy. <laughs> if it's been crooked, I put it in the midline. I'm an ENT and I, I am very much insisted on doing the septoplasties. So I don't take regular CD scans, but if the patient wants to get it, it's welcomed for sure. Another question from Italy. Are you using nasal splint? Yes, every time, because I do septoplasties. Uh, when are you removing the external splint? I have many patients from different countries. If they're living in Izmir, I would do that. For example, if I was doing a surgery for myself, I would do it in 10th day or something like that. But people want to have many reasons to go earlier for this process. I may say that at least six days, I try to keep the cast on. I do a strong taping after all. Otherwise, I want to get it the best way, seven to 10 days. And, and more than 10 days, it's not necessary. Generally, it goes up and it goes very much like loose because of swelling goes away. Another question from Spain once again. Are you detaching the lateral bones from the skin? I don't yes. get this. 
I don't, For I don't sure. understand exactly what he means, but I cannot. I maybe try to. he's asking. Maybe she's asking the. Uh, do you do white dissection like they do in piezo surgery? I don't do white dissection up to the level that you you're going up to maxillary bone, but generally I do. I separate the bones for sure, and then because I need when I'm reducing the size of the bony wall, I have to gain some skin like redraping. But everything is not like you do it like this. You have to decide how much reduction you're gonna do, how much projection loss you want to get. So the dissection should be aligned for your expectations. I mean, if you're just thinking about it, one millimeter of reduction you're deciding and it's been straight in the midline, you don't need to dissect all the way through the maxilla because you don't need to get the redraping issue of the skin to that period. So it depends on case to case. Question from France, lateral crural steel, always. Sorry. Can you hear me? Hear me? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, lateral crural steel, always. Uh, sorry, would you please ask it again because I had a connection problem. Yes, the, the question is from France and uh, the colleagues is asking lateral crural steel, always or not? This is a good question. I don't want to use lateral crural steel as much as I did before, because now we, we were thinking that, okay, lateral crural steel is good, but it's only good for enough lat, lower lat cartilage length and you just want to change its like, like configuration. If you lack the length, like in some racial issues, like Indian people, like, like some, some people from, from South America, they have very weak cartilages and very short ones, right? And then you cannot steal a short cartilage, right? We have to understand the anatomy. So, I was doing it a lot before. Nowadays, I am not regularly doing it. I am trying to see the, the tip position, which I desire, and I stretch the lower lat. If it's been enough, I only use it like that. If it's not enough, I reconstruct it again to lengthen the lower lat cartilage. Perfect. So there would be a lot of uh, questions, but uh, we're running out of time. For any other question, uh, Serkan, would you please uh, recommend your email or any contact uh, in which uh, our colleagues can... Yeah, for you? sure. They can reach out my email whenever they want. I just gave it uh, in the beginning of the, of, of the presentation. My name and surname at yahoo.com is my mail. They may reach me, reach out me whenever they want. I just... And also I have an Instagram, they can always reach, reach there. I, I answer all my questions by myself. Is there any um, meeting or a live course you would suggest in which we can get to you? Okay, it's three hours later, I'm going to Istanbul for a live course meeting. I'm gonna do a live surgery there in Abdul Kadir Göksel's meeting. And, uh, and also two weeks later, I have another one like precision, rhino, uh, uh, precision rhinoplasty case like Emre Ilhan is, is the founder of this course. I'm going to do another live surgery there. So I'm going to go and do the live surgeries. All people are welcomed for sure. And also there is an all-in-one rhinoplasty meeting. Me, Edgar and Hussein Balakchi and many good surgeons are there. And Emre Ilhan is also founder. And so we will have, in these two months, we will have many occasions to see each other as surgeons. And thank you very much for this, just also to tell this to, to people. Thank you. So thank you, Sergeant, for being with us today. If for anyone interested, you can watch back again this meeting on our YouTube channel. Uh, I recommend you to the next live round, round which is going to be May 4th. Um, Fazil Abidin from Turkey. Once again, he's going to talk about the spreader flaps and grafts. So thank you, Serkan, for being with us. And I hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you, my friend, for your invitation. That's a pleasure for me to meet you up. 
and hope to see you in another occasion. Thank you very much for all the audience. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye.